Welcome to part three of our inquiry into exactly what the human spirit is. Uh, as you might recall, in parts one and two, we talked about sort of general things that apply to the human spirit, and then we recognized that there is a, um, a difference, and the, di the distinction with respect to the human spirit is whether people have the Holy Spirit or not. If they do not have the Holy Spirit, then they are subject to the lusts and desires of their flesh and of their mind being taken captive by Satan at his will. It is an old spirit. It is darkened. It's blinded. It is separated from God. It's an enemy of God. And uh, it's it's uh, deceived. And... Um, in this video, we're going to be talking about the new spirit. And so let me start by reading the passage that explicitly uses the term new spirit in Ezekiel 36. And again, this is this verse is, is probably the most comprehensive verse of exactly what it means to be born again. Um, that phrase that we get from John chapter 3. Um, there's a whole in renovation of the inner man that's going on. Uh, so this is Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and will cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And so, um, back in uh, years ago, several years ago, I would read this and I would say, okay, new spirit, right? New spirit implies that there's an old spirit, which we talked about in the last video. And so I'd say, okay, when I hear the word new, I want to hit up, oh, new, okay, done, period, moving on. And that's what I believed and that's what, what I understood from Scripture for a long time. But this is part of the reason why it's so important to, to look at the whole revelation of God. This is um, three verses, 25, 26, and 27 of Ezekiel chapter 36. God did not just release a Bible even with Ezekiel 36 and nothing else. He didn't just release a Bible of three verses. He released a Bible of 33,000 verses. And we have to take the whole revelation of God and not just what we understand or what we've read. It's part of the reason why it's so critical and important to read the book cover to cover so that we can know it. Um, and this is, this is a, a great guard against false teachers, of which there are many right now at this very day. And on YouTube, I just saw a video of a guy claiming to be Christ on YouTube preaching meditation. Um, there are many false teachers. How, how can we know we can read the Bible and be familiar with the doctrines and the revelation that God has given us and then um, test what is said? Jesus, right? Do not believe all spirits, as John says in First John chapter 4, but test the spirits. And the Bible gives us tests for knowing who's speaking the truth and who isn't speaking truth, right? And so whenever I, I believe this, I would I would just read one verse and I'd say, oh, new spirit. Okay, end of discussion. Well, it's more complicated than that. The way that the Bible talks about, the way that the New Testament authors, the doctrine of the apostles, the way that they talk about salvation is not just, oh, oh it's done, it's done, it's, it's done, period, we will never discuss it again. No. I mean, if that was the case, we would only need one verse that just said my little rant right, right there, right? Salvation is done in that either you're sealed with the Holy Spirit or you're not. There's nobody who's partially sealed with the Holy Spirit or something like that. Either you have the Holy Spirit or you don't. There is no in-between. But from the moment of being sealed with the Holy Spirit, you have the ability to begin renewing your mind, which we're going to talk about, refer to a little bit here, but we're going to talk about it um, more in depth in another video in a sort of reference on the uh, human spirit. It's a process, okay? And so um, a lot of times the people who, who will make the claim, people from Bethel out of Redding, California, unfortunately will teach this and say, well, Christians don't have a sin nature anymore. Um, we're a new creation. Uh, you know, buried in death, raised in newness of life, something like that. So what, what part of that don't you understand? 
Well, the part that I don't understand is that there's there's 33,000 verses. There's not just those verses. Are those verses strong? Do those verses tell us truth? Yeah, but that that's not the only thing that the Bible says. The Bible says other stuff. And we would do well to know the other stuff, right? And so the... Um, well, let's just read this Ephesians 4. Again, we're going we're gonna to see, I talk in a video about, is it possible for a person to not have a, the influence of an external spirit upon them? Is there any kind of independent person? And so that, that video is also in this section on this, the, um, the human spirit, which you can check out if you want to. But the, the, the Bible points for people who are sealed with the Holy Spirit, the Bible paints this picture uh, this is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 21 through 24. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former converse, conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, right? I mean, if you he's writing he's writing to the Ephesians who are Christians, who are many of them presumably are sealed in the Holy Spirit. If if there's no process here, right, then why is he saying this? So he's saying, Don't go to Mars. Don't you do it. Don't go to Mars or else you'll be filthy wicked sinners. But of course, how are they going to go to Mars? I mean, it would be exceedingly hard 2,000 years later for us to do that. They couldn't do it. And so you're, you're admonishing someone to do something that they can't possibly do. If they don't have a sin nature, then, um, then how can you put off the old man? How can you put off what you don't have? Well, you can't, right? And so the way that the New Testament authors talk about salvation is not, Oh, it's done. In a discussion, it's done. The way that New Testament authors talk about salvation is have been saved, which is the it's done part, but there's two more, right? Have been saved, are being saved, and will be saved. And I think that in the description, not only will I link the book, Who is the Holy Spirit, but I will also link another uh, document which I have, which which has the verses, all the verses listed out under each category. And I think reading through it, you can see that, man, this is this is a really big underlying presupposition. Honestly, I just learned it a few years ago. And it's just like how pervasive the teaching is in the New Testament. Um, are being saved, that's where we're at right now. We have been sealed with the Holy Spirit and we are in the process of renewing our minds, putting off the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And we're being renewed in the spirit of our mind again because our mind is a spirit. Now, there's one other verse that talks about sort of renewing your mind in a very explicit way. And so Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. Remember, Satan is the god of this world. He's called the prince of the power of the air. Be not conformed to this world. Remember, John says anyone who loves this world does not have the love of the Father in them, right? Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so this is, so we're, we're asking a question about this new spirit, aka this new mind. And part of this new mind is that we start to have the ability, as our mind is being transformed, process, it's a journey. As our mind is being transformed, we all of a sudden have a, a knowledge of the will of God. And so, you know, I'd ask people who have been taught a theology that you don't have a sinful nature anymore. According, according to this verse, if your mind has been transformed, which would be a, an indication of something that's done, right, and not in process, uh, you must know the perfect will of God. Right, because you your mind has been transformed, and therefore you may prove that which is good and acceptable and, and perfect will of God. Right. So, are you claiming that you you really know the perfect will of God, and so you never have any of these prayers? God, what do you want me to do, and where do you want me to go, and what are you doing, and what's going on? Well, no, you know the perfect will of God because your mind's been renewed. Right, because it is done, 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 and there's nothing else to say about it. Is that your experience? Is that is that how you live your life, and is that how the people around you live their lives? 
Uh, we're told by Paul, I don't think I'm going to read this one because I'm going to deal with it in the other video on renewing your mind, but we are told to take every thought captive. Um, bringing into captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. And so you recall again, as the, the mind is a spirit, demons are also spirits. They are inherently compatible to be able to influence our thoughts and our attitudes and our thinking, right? And so we, recognizing the things of God, right? And then a spirit influences us. And what's the way that we know it? Because we see a shadow on the wall. The way that we know it is because our, th our thoughts start going to things that are not um, godly, that are not honoring. I'm just going to read this verse real quick out of um, Philippians and this is another one of the, the, the increasing fruits of the renewed mind, the new spirit that God is, is giving us through the process, which is peace. Philippians 4, 6 through 9, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds, aka the human spirit, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. And so in your thoughts and in your thinking, are your thoughts resentment and um, bitterness, even just a little bit, anger, frustration, malice, um, selfish ambition, self-centeredness, or are they things that are honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report and of virtue? Um, right? And so I'm not saying that it's easy. It's definitely not easy, but it is that one of the ways that we recognize that we are under the influence of, a, of an evil spirit and we, we are agreeing with our sin nature because we're giving place to the devil is because our, our thoughts are directly influenced right, by the enemy and we have to take every thought captive. Um, we're able to start setting our sights Above, on heaven, on the things unseen, which we are, and receive the spiritual wisdom which God gives all of Second or First Corinthians chapter two, um, Colossians three one through five. If then, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on the things above, not on the things of earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye shall appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication and cleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry, right? And so again, the, quest, the question of does a Christian have a sinful nature? Paul saying, don't go to Mars. <laughs> don't you do it. If you go to Mars, you're the most wicked person who's ever lived. How is somebody 2,000 years going to go, going to, going to do something like that? And then why is Paul, who knows that they can't go to Mars, why would he tell them to do something that they can't do? If you don't have fornication, your members which are upon the earth, fornication and cleanness and ordinate affection. If you don't have any of this stuff, right? If you're just, you're just utterly new and you're just more saved than anyone's ever been saved or will ever be saved, then Paul telling you to mortify these things is like telling you to not be a Martian. He's telling you not to use your third arm, which you don't have. So you can't use what you don't have. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, we need a whole revelation of Scripture to understand who the, the new man is and wh where we find ourselves in this life and why we find ourselves going through so many struggles and hardships and difficulties and persecutions and why so much of that is in our mind, right? Because we're struggling with the old man. The Holy Spirit is engaging um in a scorched earth war against your old man and Satan is fighting back, tempting you and alluring you and seducing you and you're, and, and, and the sin nature, I believe ultimately the sin nature is because you're willing to give him place. If you don't have a sin nature anymore, then you really shouldn't sin. You really shouldn't sin because when you sin, you give place to the devil. And surely a person who is not a sinner does not give place to the devil. 
even if they're deceived. Like God, God would reveal it to that person that they're giving place to the devil. They would recognize his fruit immediately. Okay, another implication of the new mind is that we actually love God's law. And so Romans 7 is one of those verse, one of those passages where people just utterly, utterly get it wrong. And so um, the, the, way, the way that people from Bethel will um, interpret Romans 7 is they'll say, well, it's the unsaved person. Except you're going to see here that that, that is utterly, utterly, utterly foolishness and does, cannot possibly be true. Right. Romans seven eighteen through 24. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Of course, that's, that's in keeping with their claim that, that they don't have a sin nature. Because it, the, if they don't have a sin nature, then this can't possibly apply to a Christian. Right? Again, it's their, it's their philosophy that they made up. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present in me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil, which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. They say, oh, sin doesn't dwell in you anymore because you're a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. It is done, 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 done. We will never discuss it again. That's what their, that's what their philosophy is that they made up, right? I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present in me. No, 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 no. I'm good. I'm utterly, utterly, utterly new. I'm the newest person who's ever lived and will ever live, right? That's what they say. Something along those lines. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Now here we go. Right? We're told elsewhere that, that we are enemies. When we are sinners, we are enemies of God in our mind. The carnal mind cannot please God. For it is at enmity with God. Which is in Romans... Here we go. They, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. This is Romans 8, 5. But they that are after the spirit mind the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but spiritually minded is life. Because the carnal mind is enmity with God. It is not subject to the law of God. Neither can it be. And so how can it, how can the, on the one hand, the carnal mind not be subject to the law of God, but yet um, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. No, 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 no. The, the Stunner Bethel theology, which sells by the millions, cannot explain this because you can't hate God and hate his law and love God and love his law at the same time. That's absurd. It's ridiculous, right? It's, it's ridiculous. And so who are we talking about in this verse? Who is the person who loves the law of God? The only possible person that it could be is the person who is starting on the process of having a renewed mind because they've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. The person whose carnal in mind is at enmity with God and hates God's law. Therefore, Romans 7 cannot be about unbelievers. It's not possible, right? I delight in the law after the inward man, the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, this is talking about you and me, folks, if you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Uh, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. Oh, wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from this body of death. Right? And so there's one more verse, which I'm not going to read, but then we move on to Romans chapter 8. And Paul answers the question that he just asked. Therefore... Or there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. And so now we see an operation of the spirit where instead of setting your mind on the things of the flesh, you're setting your mind on the things of the spirit. Therefore, you're being empowered and enabled. You're um, um, subject to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit do mind the things of the spirit. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace." Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So they that are in the flesh cannot um, please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Right? And so now we get this model of 
setting your mind. So now, now all of a sudden, instead of going from being an enemy of God, right? And cannot please God because the carnal mind is enmity with God. Now you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And now you have the possibility of setting your mind on something that you didn't have before. Right? And so you can start to set your mind on the things of the Holy Spirit. God can start teaching you and revealing to you. One of the things that the Holy Spirit does is convict us of sin. And so he can show you um, where you've had wrong thinking and wrong agreements. In fact, the word repentance, metanoia in the Greek, means to change your mind. Okay? And we're going to talk about this in the next video. Um, just, t Just two or three more things just super quickly because I'm just getting way out of time here. Um, we contrast in 2 Timothy 1, 7, the old spirit and the new spirit. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, the old spirit, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And again, this is a process, right? Do we just, oh, so, oh my gosh, I just love perfectly. Wow, how'd that happen? No, it's a process, right? Peace. Already read uh, Philippians chapter four. Um, the peace of God, which passeth, passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And it comes through prayer, life, and an intimacy with God. Isaiah twenty six three. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. And then finally, I'm not going to read out of the fruit of the spirit. Galatians five twenty two. Well, I guess I will read it actually, because again, it, it illustrates my point of of the flesh nature versus the spirit nature of uh, the Christian. Uh, and so my point is self-control, which they use the word temperance here in the King James English. Uh, Galatians 5, 22 through 26, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in a spirit, let us also walk in a spirit. Isn't it interesting that he he says this, and then let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. If you don't have that old man, then you ain't going to be doing that, right? Because that's that's just not who you are. Except that there's a whole bunch of Christians that provoke one another and are jealous and are selfishly ambitious and so on and so forth, right? If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We have the ability to choose the new freedom that we didn't have before to be able to set our mind on the things of the Holy Spirit and thus... Um, gain access to this renewed mind over time. In another video, um, in this section on the human spirit, we're going to be talking about exactly what that entails, the process of renewing the mind.